Good morning. Good morning, Jerry Lee. Or at least I thought, yeah, I thought I heard her. I thought she said good morning, Leyland. So I'm going to read a few scriptures out of Philippians. And, you know, with, with Thanksgiving here, the week of Thanksgiving and stuff, you know, <clears throat> it's just, I don't know, for me it's good to, to stay focused on the things that matter. Uh, Philippians 4, I'm going to start reading in verse 4. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is any praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You know, I just want to be a, an encouragement now with just everything that, again, there's still a lot of a lot of things to, I don't know, worry or stress about going on in, in life right now. And uh, it's easy to start thinking something and then act on it, and it's not what if you were focusing on the things that are good, the things that are lovely, the things that are praiseworthy, you act on those things. We don't allow the circumstances of life to, to bring doubt or frustrations in our mind and then we start acting on them. Then pretty soon you're, you're walking down a path that it's not exactly, well, Jesus isn't on that path. I'll just say it like that. So uh, just an encouragement. There's always something to be thankful for, always. It was cold this morning setting up, but I'm always thankful to be at church, surrounded by other believers. So, Father, as we come together this morning, God, we, we're thankful. Lord, it's the season to be thankful. <clears throat> Jesus, if you're in our hearts, Lord, there's never a season not to be thankful. Father, we thank you. Lord, we, we pray that we would keep you front and center in our hearts and our minds and, and everything that we uh, do and think is focused around you. That the negative thoughts, the negative attitudes, the anything that could go wrong, God, we don't, we don't focus on those, Lord. You are good and faithful, so we put our faith in you. So there is no reason to stress, Lord, we can live a thankful life. God, and, uh, and we're here to proclaim that this morning and worship. Lord, so uh, you be praised in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. I just want to pray as we enter into hearing the word. That last song, In Your Presence. Heavenly Father, you made a way that there is nothing that can hinder us from entering your presence. We learned that last week with the tearing of the veil. You made the way available for us to come into your presence. So the only thing that could possibly hinder us would be us choosing not to enter. Lord, I pray that you would build in us, that you would draw us by your Holy Spirit, a desire, a longing to enter into your presence at any time, nothing hindering, that we would come boldly to the throne of grace every day, seeking your presence because we know we are nothing without you. Lord, I am so grateful that we have access to you every day, every moment, every second. We can come boldly before you. We can also come humbly before you and sit at your feet and worship you. Lord, let us never hesitate to worship. I pray that we wouldn't be hindered by man. We wouldn't be hindered by ourselves. There would be nothing that would hinder us. But God, there would be something in us, a fire and a passion to come and be in your presence. And let it begin this morning in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you would open up your word to us this morning. I pray that you would speak boldly through Lance. That it would be your word coming forth. Open up our ears to hear. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. You guys get a little treat this morning. I, uh, <clears throat> on Thursday nights, you know, we do the young adults, and uh, this last Thursday, um, we actually had to cancel what uh, I normally would have been doing for Thursday night. I'm actually going to share with you guys because as I was preparing it actually for Thursday, I was thinking to myself, man, this would be really good for the whole church, you know. And so what we've been doing on Thursday nights is we're taking them through uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 6, verse 1 or verse 1, 2, and 3 there, where it talks, where Paul talks about the elementary principles uh, of building a relationship with Christ. If uh, The verse is uh, Hebrews 6, 1, uh, starting with verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And so there's a lot loaded in this little short passage. But what, uh, what we've been bringing to their attention, and we've been working through this with them, because Paul starts it off by saying, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. So these are the elementary things. There's not one of us that would have expected to go to college or make it through college without an elementary principle of reading, right? You couldn't, you couldn't go through college without being able to read in, in elementary schools where you learn to read and write. And so these things literally uh, are the six fundamental ingredients to a uh, solid foundation in Christ that you build upon. It's not something that you strive for. This is the baseline. This is like, you know, this is like, this is the base. This is elementary. This is the, uh, this is the, these are the things that we have to get right so that we can uh, grow in God, so that we can uh, have a life and have a, uh, uh, a walk with God that uh, reveals the kingdom. You find when you have a strong foundation, you're not, uh, 
you know, you're not a victim to false teaching as much. You're not a victim to being uh, deceived and misled when you have these foundational principles right. I'll read them again. There's six of them here. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Uh, the doctrine of baptism, laying on of hands, resur resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So just a, a few of these here. Uh, the doctrine of baptisms, plural. Uh, how much has the church avoided that because of controversial issues with uh, the being baptized in the Holy Spirit? And so the, many churches avoid this whole issue uh, when it's supposed to be a foundation. You have to know what the word says about it so that you're not deceived. But laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. There's all these things that uh, I think there are many things that the church has avoided and so uh, for Thursday nights for young adults, we're walking through this and, and uh, teaching them out of the word what Jesus says about each one of these things so that there's a foundation there. I was going to do Thursday night on the doctrine of laying on of hands. Now, I try not, typically I try not to be a super doctrinal uh, sort of guy where I... Uh, your relationship is built on all these do's and don'ts. Uh, and so, but the laying on of hands is an important one. I'm going to, I'm going to hit that today. And uh, I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be good for the entire church uh, to realize what laying on of hands is and why it's there and what it's for and what it accomplishes and, and, and this. And so that's where we're going to go. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can open them up to the book of Jonah. That's somewhere that's right near the end of the Old Testament. I think it's right in between Obadiah and Micah and the, and the minor prophets, right near the end of the Old Testament. It's going to take me a little bit to get there, but that's where we'll land for a bit. Everyone knows the story of Jonah, you know, and the fish. And so uh, I, I'm hoping it'll be familiar, but uh, so today, doctrine of laying on of hands. We're going to start at the very beginning. Uh, and I will, um, this last week as I was studying this out, I was even listening to uh, other pastors um, talk about laying on of hands and stuff. And so I've, I've kind of hijacked several things that I thought, oh, yeah, that explains it well. That's a good point, you know, and stuff. And so um, this isn't all stuff that, you know, God just revealed to me this week, but, or he revealed, you know, through others also. Um, so, like I said, I'm going to start at the beginning. We, we hear these terms, God is omnipresent, God is on, omnipotent, God is, uh, uh, you know, he, he's om, omniscient. And so, I, we're going to start at the beginning here. Uh, God is omnipresent. In Psalms, uh, 130, 139, it says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get it uh, away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the furthest uh, oceans, even there your hand will guide me, your strength will support me. So God is present everywhere. There's nowhere that you can literally get away from God. He is everywhere. I'm going to hit these three things here because... We have to have a good understanding of God uh, in relation to us. And so the first thing is God is everywhere. You can't get away from him. Uh, he's in all things, right? In uh, Jeremiah, it says, can anyone hide from me in a secret place? Uh, am I not everywhere in all the heavens and the earth? So God is everywhere. That's, that's elementary. We all know that. Uh, God is omnipotent, which means God is all-powerful. Uh, in Isaiah 44, it says, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer and Creator, I am the Lord who made all things. I alone stretched out the heavens. Uh, who was with me when I made the earth? Colossians 1, it says, uh, for by him all things were created that, that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominion, principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. 
And he is before all things, and all th in him all things consist. Now, this is a good verse because we understand that God is all-powerful, but we don't, uh, I think a lot of times we, we forget all things are in him and for him. So, uh, how do I explain this here? <laughs> God isn't in eternity. God isn't in heaven. God isn't in your heart. God isn't in this place. This place is in God. The, your heart is in God. It's found in him. The heavens is found in him. God doesn't like dwell in this whole nother realm. That other realm is in him. There is nothing eternal apart from God. So it's not like God could step out of eternity and eternity still exists and heaven still exists and even hell. See, we don't even think. God is a consuming fire and we think that, that hell is here and God is here and that hell even, and I, I use this kind of just hopefully to get our attention. Hell doesn't exist outside of God because it's eternal and everything eternal exists in him. It's not like there's a form of knowledge or wisdom or there's something that he could gain that he hasn't gained because all things consist and exist in him. So it's out of him everything comes. Your understanding, the understanding of angels, everything, it doesn't like operate over here and then God says, oh, hey, that's a good idea. Every idea exists in him and is from him. Every every motion, everything. And so uh, when, it's, when God, it says God is all powerful and he created all things and all things are in him and consist and exist in him. That's not like he's here and then he's there and oh, he's over here and he's just bouncing around from galaxy to galaxy doing whatever. Those galaxies only exist in him. If he were to like step out, they would crumble and fall or dissolve. It's, it's because of his power that everything is even upheld. So it's a good, it's a, uh, it's a good way to check ourselves because sometimes we try to apply our human understanding uh, to the, you know, to the nature or the person of God. And we can't cope. We can't understand. It's not like, uh, and for me, this was big as I was, you know, thinking about this this week. It's like, if God stepped out of heaven, heaven would no longer exist. If his presence were to leave, it's, it's found in him. In eternity, we talk about, you know, this little moment of time, this vapor that we're on the earth. You know, and then we, we die and hopefully we go to heaven and step into e the eternal realm. The, God doesn't live in the eternal realm. The eternal realm lives in him. Wherever he goes, it goes. Wherever he restricts it into time, it's restricted into time. But it's not like it's something that this is just his home. Its home is him. If you separated eternity from God, then eternity would crash. That's the power of, that's the power of God. When it says all powerful, it, it means all powerful. There's, there's no middle ground here. God is omniscient. He is all knowing. In Psalm 147, it says, but great uh, is our Lord and mighty in power and his understanding is infinite. Job 37, uh, this is an awesome, you know, even chapter in Job. I, this, the end of Job, I really enjoy. It says, do you know how the clouds are balanced? Those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge. See, uh, and, and this is how it is. If we're going to think about God and try to understand God, God doesn't learn. Uh, God isn't, if I were to say God's not surprised, nothing surprises him, you would say, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. He, nothing surprises, nothing shocks God. He's not like, whoa, that caught me by surprise. 
Well, why is that? Because knowledge comes out of him. It doesn't go in. Things come out of God. Nothing goes in. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is everywhere. My point to this, to hit these, to start back at the beginning here, is first to understand this perspective that God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything. Nothing. He needs nothing to exist ever for as long as his existence has been, as long as it will be, he needs nothing to exist. And, th- and this, is, this is, to understand laying on of hands, this is the, this is the foundation. God needs nothing. Uh, except, except you. Because he needs nothing to exist, but he needs you to coexist. And it's not because, it's not because he actually needs you, because we know this. If you were talking to God and you were praying, you wouldn't be like, God, you need me so much. Right? You see, he took, you got to get this. He took his unlimited power and ability and decided it to limit it. Decided to limit his unlimited power. He decided because of who he is, it was, it was a, a, like a calculated, an intentional effort not to just want you, not to just love you, but to actually need you. It was a choice and he made it. And now it's, a, it's like it's a law. He needs you not to exist, but to coexist. Uh, it, and we see it in, even in the creation and in the beginning Uh, he chose to form a partnership with Adam. He didn't need Adam, but he chose and he decided to need him. There's a difference between wanting you and needing you. Because when you pray and you think and and you want, it it gets into this whole, uh, like where we're at in the country and there's this political turmoil and there's this COVID-19 turmoil and there's all this turmoil. And I even hear regularly, I hear uh, people say, oh, well, God's sovereign over it all. You know, he's sovereign, he's sovereign, God's sovereign. And I, 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 and I want to ask, what does that even mean? Because sovereign really just, I've said this before, supreme ruler, supreme ruler, that's all it means. So when, when you say, oh, yeah, well, you know, this country's in turmoil, but God's sovereign. What? Like, does that mean that he's going to, like, jump out of heaven and come to the U.S. and do something crazy? Apart from your prayers, apart from your wants, apart from your desires? What does that exactly mean? It's going to go his way anyways? Well, it also says that he wishes, you know, that not every, you know, that uh, everyone would be saved. He sa- it says, how does it say it? That it's not my will that any man perish, but all would come to repentance. That's his desire. That's his sovereignty, is the hope that every person is saved. Does his sovereignty reign in the hearts of man on the earth? No. So what, is it to, what does it mean to say, he's, well, he's sovereign. He's sovereign over this. Well, yeah, he is. He's the supreme ruler, and everybody will stand before him as, as their judge. But my point is here is that uh, so this is his power and this is his choice. And his choice was to coexist, to co-manage the earth. In fact, uh, in Genesis 2, it says, out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what Adam would call them. And it says, and whatever Adam called every living creature, that was its name. And so Adam gave uh, names to all the cattle, the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. My thought is, is this, is why would God have Adam name every creature, every living thing? Adam doesn't have the ability to create it. See, there's, but, you know, 
God, I'm sure, could come up with some pretty good names. I, I really doubt his vocabulary was like short, and he was like, oh, no, uh, what am I going to Adam, Adam, come here, I need some help. Uh, that's probably not what God was thinking. God created it, and he could have named it, maybe even named animals better. I mean, if you think about some of the animal names, I'm just, you know, I'm thinking maybe God could have done it better. And, uh, but that's not what God wanted because he made a deliberate decision to partner with man. And if you partner with somebody, that means you have a part and they have a part. God's probably not interested in silent part, being a silent partner in your life. And, and he's probably not interested in you being a silent partner in his life. See, because this, we know that God doesn't need man to exist. But he chose to partner with man to manage the earth. I personally think that's probably why there's no life found anywhere outside of the planet. I mean, you think about all these all these places and planets and stars and galaxies and Hubble telescope going out and they're searching for life somewhere. The word Bible is eternal. It's the word of God it says he created man in his image and he partnered with man to manage the earth. And he allowed man to manage the earth. I, I, I don't know, it's kind of crazy thinking, but I think maybe that'll be part of heaven is that He'll partner with man again to manage other places, galaxies, planets. But they're not there because we haven't partnered with him there yet. Maybe that's something we'll do in heaven. You'd be like, you know, sitting on the sitting on a board of people developing these galaxies and universes or something with God. There's no life out there. My point is, there's no life. Because the Bible isn't just for planet Earth, right? It's the living word of God. It's eternal. If there's some other galaxy with some other creature and some other life form there, guess what they have to live by? The word of God. It, it's not like for this neighborhood, and it's not for this state, and it's certainly not for just this planet. It's the word. Everything is upheld by his word. Guess what you'll be judged by? So every living creature that stands before the throne of God, guess what's going to be pulled out? The word. So it's not like it, it it's not like, okay. Uh, are you in Jonah chapter one? <laughs> As we're getting ready to start there, I'll read one more uh, verse out of Matthew to show the partnership that God intentionally decided to do with man. It says uh, in Matthew 13, verse 58, it says, now this is talking about Jesus, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. This is, uh, depending on your tra translation, uh, some translations will say that he could do no mighty work there because of their unbelief. Save, heal, heal, a few people. It's the only place in the Bible that that leads to the the thought here that Jesus is limited. And that word in the Greek that is used for he did not or he could not literally means the definition of that Greek means he the no the ability uh, the strength or ability. So he. He didn't have the ability. The Son of God didn't have the ability to heal. Every other place in the Bible where he goes into a town to heal, it says they brought all who were sick, all who were oppressed, and he healed every single one of them. It's over and over in the Gospels where he heals every sick person in his city. But this city he goes to, and he could not do mighty works and many miracles. Why couldn't he do it? Because of their faith, because he is partnered with man to manage the earth. 
And so inside of this partnership, he has a part, man has a part. Man's part was faith, but because man couldn't do his part, Jesus couldn't do his part. That's how this thing works is that he, you, when you take a God with unlimited ability and power, and then he chooses to limit it because he wants a partnership instead of just a, I'm just going to rule the earth and do it all myself. So when you establish a partnership, that means uh, you're not doing everything and they're doing something. And so, so in Jonah, I, this is why I wanted to go to Jonah is I wanted to, uh, this is a, this story is an awesome example of this. And Jonah, I'll read verses one through five. I'm going to pick some verses throughout the whole story so that we kind of get it wrapped up quickly. Um, it says in verse one, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, uh, the son of Amittai, a hard word there, uh, saying, arise and go to Nineveh. And, and just kind of put that in the back of your mind. Arise, go to Nineveh that great city and cry out against it for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee from, uh, to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare and he went down into it, uh, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great, uh, wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest of the sea. And so that ship was about to be broken up and then the mariners uh, were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship uh, into the sea to lighten the load. So I want you to see this. Every man was afraid because of this mighty tempest, and it was the ship's about to be broken up, and it says that they were all afraid, and they cried out. Uh, each one cried out to his God. Now, none of those were the gods. Tarshish is not uh, Jewish. You know, that's not right down the street from, from Jerusalem. This is, this is not, you know, this is way northern uh, up out of Israel. And so uh, every one of these guys are crying out to their own God. They, crew, they threw the cargo overboard. And then in verse 10, we'll jump down to verse 10. It says, and then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. So they're throwing everything overboard. They're praying and stuff to all of their gods. And Jonah finally comes up out of the bottom of the ship and says, okay, guys, it's me. It's me. I'm disobeying God. I'm running. It's my fault. And they say, why in the world have you done this? We're going to die. And in verse 15, it says, and, and Jonah, before verse 15, Jonah tells them, you need to just throw me overboard. And at first they all refused. And they kept praying to their gods and they kept trying to lighten the load. And, but the waves, everything just kept, get, kept getting worse. And so then in verse 15, it says, so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. So, so what ends up happening is all their own gods that they were praying to and worshiping basically was just, you know, the truth was revealed. They were worthless, worthless. And there was really just one God. And that one God, they, they began to worship and they made vows to that God. And then it says, uh, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Uh, and that's basically near the end of chapter one in Jonah. And I'm just going to jump ahead. Chapter two is three days in the belly of a fish. Jonah is praying repentance for three days. He's, all of chapter two is a prayer. He's praying and repenting. God, he's declaring the mighty works of God. He's declaring his, you know, his omnipresence, his omnipotent, his omniscient. He's declaring all this stuff, uh, who God is, and he's, he's, and he's repenting. And then in chapter three, it starts uh, in verse one, and this is still, so he's been praying and repenting this whole time. And it says in verse one, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh. The same 
words as the first commandment, arise and go to Nineveh. And so God says a second time, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, to me, and I hope to you, does it appear to you that God is very interested in doing your part? To me, it's like, okay, uh, this is a reality check here. In this partnership, God's not interested in doing your part. He's only going to do his part. His part is the supernatural. Your part is the natural. And so when we're talking about this this co-management and this cooperation and this partnership with the Lord, and and I I use these terms uh, to to help us to understand that we're partnering with God, that doesn't mean we're operating in authority with God. Right? The partnership is probably a 5149 sort of thing where, uh, yeah, you could say 50-50. I I don't want to, you know, get all technical. But God did say go to Nineveh and when... Jonah didn't, he ended up in the belly of a fish. So there is an authority there in this cooperation that the Father has. But what we do have to understand is that there is, in this partnership, you have a part, and he's not going to do his part. And, And just so we know, his part is the part that you can't do. See, he actually can do both parts, but that's not what he wants to do. See, he could have made the animal and named it, but that's not what he wants to do. And so in making this partnership, he decided, okay, man can do only so much. And so that'll be man's part. And then everything that man can't do, which is the majority of every situation where you pray to God and you ask God for help, right? The majority of that situation is something that you can't do. And so that's the part that God does. We'll call that the supernatural because we're natural. We have a supernatural God that, you know, right, that's in our heart and our heart is in him. But, but you're a natural person. You can, you, can, uh, you can claim and declare how supernatural you are in every effort to be operating in gifts or or prophecies or, you know, you can, you can claim and push to be supernatural as much as you want. And the reality is you don't eat, you're going to get hungry. You don't drink, you're going to die. If you don't take care of your body, you're not going to be healthy. You're a very natural person. And, and with, and I, I see this sometimes in the churches that in our effort to get spiritual and supernatural and be like super spiritual, uh, sometimes it gets to be an excuse of not doing those natural things. That's our part. That's our part to do. See, your part is if you wanted, if you, you know, came to somebody that was uh, on the street corner holding a sign and needing something to eat, you have a part. And when you pray, Quarter pounders are not going to rain down from heaven. You have a part. You have to sacrifice. You need to step out. You have to have faith. You have to say, okay, God, what can I do here? How can I help? And then God moves in and does the supernatural part, which is pierce the heart of man, right? Which is to reveal his goodness. God does the things that man can't do, but man has a part. And so, uh, again, God isn't interested in doing man's part. In fact, he went to great lengths. He even, how long do you think it took for the fish to grow large enough to swallow Jonah and have Jonah live in his belly? Probably a long time. So a long time ahead, God started preparing for Jonah to show Jonah, I'm not going to do this without you. You have a part. I want to do this, but you have a part. And God started preparing long time in advance to show and to reveal to man that there is a, I want a partnership with you. 
I want to move in the supernatural, and I need you to move in the natural. And so, uh, <clears throat> if we, uh, well, if we just jump down a little bit ahead uh, in the very last verse of that uh, chapter, and then chapter three, and then moving into the couple verse, first verses in chapter four, it says, then God saw their works because Jonah went to Nineveh like he was supposed to in the beginning and the whole city repented and they all came to God and it says they tore their clothes and they put ashes and sackcloth on their head, put gunny sacks on their heads to show humility because, you know, when you have a revelation of God being as powerful as he is, the first thing that your heart should want to do is to humble yourself before him. And so back then, they'd cover themselves with dirt. They'd put a sack on their head. They'd do anything to try and show themselves being humble before an all-powerful God. And so they humbled themselves. A whole city, a massive city, thousands, I think, I don't know, it says in there, I can't even remember how much it says, but it's a lot of people, uh, thousands of people. They humbled themselves, and it says God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented uh, from the disaster that he uh, had said that he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became very angry. See, Jonah, Jonah was asked to do his part. He didn't do his part. So God made it really uncomfortable for him until he did his part. And then God did his part, his own part, and then Jonah didn't like it. <laughs> and it, uh, <clears throat> and so in verse two, and it says, and so he prayed to the Lord and said, ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my own country, therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. If you will do your part, he is slow to anger, full of loving kindness, desiring to change and be gracious and merciful. See, see if we understood how vital our part is for the mercy and the grace of God to be revealed to mankind, then we wouldn't be so uh, hesitant or insecure, shy, whatever you want to call it, stubborn, I don't know. <laughs> if we knew, like Jesus couldn't do many mighty works because of the lack of faith, let me ask you this. Is there something in your life that God would like to do but he's limited. His unlimited power has been limited because you still have a part. I would encourage you to be like, God, I've been praying and praying and praying for this. I would encourage you to say, God, what's my part? What is my part in this? Because that unlimited power to show grace and mercy and loving kindness and to change things, to reveal himself in powerful, mighty ways is restricted to the participation of man. Uh, a quick reminder here, whose part come first? Our part. So where would the faith be 
if God went around doing his part and just healing everybody and then you just followed up around and said, bless you, bless you, bless you, or, <laughs> right? If you just like followed God around and saying, oh, that was, that was the Lord, that was the Lord, that was the Lord. They already know that's the Lord. It's supernatural. People will know that just instinctively. When something crazy happens and powerful and loving and kind and merciful and gracious, when that happens in your life, the, the, it's your reaction. Be like, whoa, that was, that was God. Even unbelievers will be like, oh, you know, mind over matter. They'll get put some. They'll still give it some sort of spiritual connotation. They recognize it's not them. It's the nature of man to not, to recognize there's something greater than me here. There would be no faith if you just followed God around and everything He was doing because He could be really efficient at doing His part, and you just like went around like a puppy dog saying, "Yep, yep, yep, yep. I agree, I agree." But that's not that's not the way this partnership is formed. The partnership is formed is, I'm not going to name the animal until you, and then I back you. I I support you. I come in and do my part that you can't do after you reach the end of you. When you reach the end of you, then I come in and that, then that's where my part starts. And there's so, there's so many things in our life, I think, that uh, we would have breakthrough if we would ask God, what is our part? What is it that, what is it that you want me to do here? Because sometimes it's not just praying. Praying is a good place to start. But maybe sometimes it's stepping out and like forgiving somebody that, ooh, I didn't really plan on forgiving. I just planned on avoiding. <laughs> you know, COVID works out real well for people that haven't forgiven. Oh, I got a reason to avoid you. In fact, I don't even have to invite you over for Thanksgiving now. <laughs> Right? Right? But is it an excuse to not do our part? I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying, are we, are we checking ourselves? This, this is, to, to bring this full circle, this is the doctrine of laying on of hands. There is no power in laying on of hands. You don't have electricity in your fingertips just ready you have a part, and your part is natural. And it's an expression of your faith to say, you know what, God, l let me show you. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to put my hand on this person. I'm going to believe for them to be healed. And then God does his part. You, your part is, as, as Christians, I think, sometimes we get, uh, we get so, sometimes we get so caught up in, those spiritual, supernatural things that we forget. Man, we have a part and it's in the natural. Maybe I just need to, you know, quit cussing so much. I don't know. Ask, ask God what are, I, and maybe it's not something bad like, oh no, you've got sin in your life and you have to get it out. I'm not, I'm not saying look for sin in your life. I'm just saying, ask God, God, what's my part? Is my part, changing my daily routine? Is it, is it forgiving or accepting or loving somebody that's been a real struggle for me to? It, you know, is it blessing somebody I normally wouldn't bless? You know, would it be, would it be working that extra 15 or 20 minutes but not documenting it on the time clock so that I make sure and get compensated for, I, I don't know. I can't tell you what your part is, but I'm saying God will tell you in fact, he's pretty determined for you to know your part. And he's not going to do his until we do ours. But ours unlocks the supernatural. Ours unlocks the loving kindness and grace and mercy from heaven. Ours, our part is the key to all of this. As simple and natural. Yeah, I mean, you can even put in there a fleshy, carnal, well, I don't you put whatever term you want in there as minimal as it appears your part is, it's the key that unlocks his part. When we understand that, we understand laying on hands. We understand every other, I'm 
the laying on of hands was the representation of this in the scripture. When you were going to pray for somebody, you laid hands on them. It wasn't like, whoa, social distance. God walked into the room. Everybody want to give him a hug, but then they'd be like, oh, wait, wait. Uh, we don't. We don't social distance from God. We don't social distance from our part. Fortunately, God is all-knowing, and so he knows how to navigate the circumstances that we face today. I'm not minimizing COVID, but I am... Uh, I would be minimizing a perspective that God doesn't know how to navigate, and so you don't have to unlock your side. You don't have to do your part. You don't... You know, God's just through this season, you know, God's just going to have to do his part without me because I can't. No. God knows. And you still have a part. And, and this, should, this should be an encouragement to us because uh, God wants. Jonah even said it. Isn't it, you know, Jonah was like, isn't this what I said you were going to do? You were going to be full of loving kindness. You're going to be merciful and gracious. I knew this. I knew this would happen. You'd save the whole city. 40,000, I think, is what it was. But uh, God wants to, and he wants us to do our part. Uh, worship team, you guys can want to close with a song today? And, uh, um, and I want to pray for you. And if you have any needs, any physical needs, any, uh, anything that you would like prayer for, you know, Quinn and I want to pray for you. And... Uh, and we'll wear our mask. Uh, God's bigger than that mask. And, uh, and, and he can gap every distance. And so if you need prayer, just, just come up and grab us and we'll be glad to pray for you. And, uh, and be encouraged that, that even in this season... God has a part for you... He has a, a job. There is, in this partnership, his, his loving kindness in his mercy and his grace wants to be released. He is desiring to release it in your life and in the lives around you. So don't resist. Don't, you don't do this whole Jonah thing uh, because cause God's not going to go anywhere. It's probably just going to get uncomfortable until we surrender to our partnership and do our part. And so, Father, I just come before you, God, because, Lord, I, I really believe that you want to do incredible things through your church in this day and in this season. God, that there wouldn't be limits on your love and limits on your grace and limits on your mercy. Father, I thank God that you would desire for your church to do the part that unlocks the door, that, that would have made the difference when Jesus approached that city. God, that there, there is something that you have for each one of us. Maybe it's big and maybe it's not. Maybe it's, it's something so simple and small that we think, surely that's not what God's asking. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would reveal to each one of us those little things, even daily. God, that would be our part to you releasing supernatural participation from heaven. God, that we wouldn't be so caught up in and being a spiritual people that we would forget to just do the little natural things. God, really, the things that you've called us to. God, there are times where, like you called Peter out on the water, God, big things in the natural but still natural. Still have to put your foot outside the boat. Still have to put your weight on the foot. 
still have to stand. Lord, I, I, God, what is this, what is this natural part that we play compared to your part? It's so small. But if we would just respond, if we just obey, if we would just believe, God, the the potential, the unlocking, Lord, the the supernatural, that's your part. God is just crazy, crazy big, crazy powerful. Lord, we... We literally hold a key. You even said, Jesus said, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. And we hold these keys, Lord, to unlock unlimited power to change people's lives. But Father, sometimes there's these these things that's not really comfortable for us to do. God, I pray that, ooh, this is sketchy. I pray that you'd make us uncomfortable until we respond. You put Jonah in a fish for three days until he would respond. Lord, I I desire to see unlimited power moving in in the lives around me to the degree I'm, I'm willing to be uncomfortable, like really uncomfortable. God, if that's what it takes for me to do my part. Father, God, I believe the heart for all of us is to surrender and say, don't make me uncomfortable, just, just make it clear so I know what to do. Because I, my heart is to obey, my heart is to desire to do my part, God, so you can do yours. And so, Father, I just thank you and I praise you. And Lord, I bless this church and this people, and I pray, God, that you'd cover them Lord, with your loving kindness, with your grace, with your mercy. Father, as they go out this week, as they uh, in and out of the things that they do in their lives, Lord. God, I pray that you'd reveal your part to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, why don't you stand and they'll close with a song and, uh, and we'll be dismissed.
song over this people today that we would keep our eyes above the waves, Lord, that we would keep our eyes on the things that you want to do, the, the, Lord, the good things, the, the, this, these, the, our part that needs to be, God, that we need, we need to do. God, don't let us show that to us, but God, keep our eyes away from that, that focus. The more that we dwell on that, the more that it looks big or it looks uh, not realistic or it looks totally out of our comfort zone. God, keep our eyes on what you want to do. Lord, that our part would be appropriate, appropriately perceived. Father, I pray that for this church and for this people, God, that we would go out this week and that we would see, Lord, the things that you want to do in the lives around us, in the community around us. God, and just the person that's next to us. So, Father, I pray, God, that we'd have the strength, the discipline to do our part, to step up, unlock the door, God, so that your loving kindness would just reign in and through us. Father, I praise you and thank you. God, I bless this people. I, Lord, I pray this week of Thanksgiving coming up, God, that it would be a, a blessed week. I know there are restrictions, but God, you, you can shower your love. God, you can show yourself real. God, you can impact the hearts of man regardless of regardless of what the restrictions are. Father, I thank you that you are great and mighty and worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen.